preparing for Pentecost was easy, right? Well, it wasn't all very easy or necessarily pretty during those 10 days in the upper room. You see, the disciples had some things that needed to be made right. And without making those things right, they weren't going to be ready for an outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. Today, Pastor Mark Finley will guide us in a study of honest confession on our fourth of 10 days journeying through the upper room. Let's open our hearts as Pastor Finley opens God's Word. Welcome back to our series titled, 10 Days in the Upper Room. If this is your first program to join us, we're studying the character qualities necessary to receive the Holy Spirit. How do you receive the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? What really happened in the upper room where the disciples opened their hearts to receive the Holy Spirit? Our program today is titled, Honest Confession. And in this program, we're going to examine why confession of sin is so important, when do you confess to another person, and when do you confess publicly, or do you ever confess publicly? As we look at the history of revival, confession really always has characterized genuine revival. Every time there is a revival mentioned in the Bible, there is confession. You can go look at the revival that took place in the days of Josiah. There was confession. In the days of Moses, Moses led Israel into a revival. There was true confession. You look at Daniel's prayer, a lengthy prayer in Daniel 9 on confession. And of course, the disciples in the upper room met together for 10 days. And one of the things that they did was confess their sins to God. Because without confession, there is this spiritual contamination of the soul. In fact, the wise man in Proverbs puts it this way, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. What does it mean when the text says whoever covers his sins will not prosper? It means this, we will not prosper spiritually unless we're honest with ourselves and honest with God. And that's what the disciples were in the upper room. These disciples met together and they were honest with God. They opened their hearts to God. They admitted their failures to God. They admitted their mistakes to God. They did not cover up their sins. If we expect to prosper in our own Christian spiritual lives, it means transparency. It means that we're not going to be trying to hide who we really are, not hiding behind some hypocritical mask. Genuine, the genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes when we are kneeling down before God in barefaced confession of our sin, openly repenting of our sin, so that our hearts are cleansed. In fact, after the ascension of Christ, the Holy Spirit did not immediately descend. There were 10 days after his ascension before the Holy Spirit was given. This time was devoted by the disciples to most earnest preparation for receiving so precious an endowment. The rich treasures of heaven were poured out to them after they had searched, notice this, their own hearts diligently and had sacrificed every idol. They were before God humbling their souls, strengthening their faith, and what? What's that last expression? Confessing their sins. So these disciples weren't playing games with God. They were confessing their sins. Now, the disciples were well aware of the Old Testament sanctuary system. And let's let our minds go back for a few moments to this Old Testament sanctuary system. In the sanctuary, if sin took place, let's suppose here is an Israelite and he gets angry with his neighbor and he slaps his neighbor in the face. What must he do? He had to take a lamb to the sanctuary. And as he took that lamb to the sanctuary, he placed his hands over the head of the lamb and confessed his sin. And let's suppose 
his friend's name was Josiah, and he had just slapped Josiah in the face. As he put his hands over the head of the lamb, he might pray a prayer like this, Dear Lord, you know I've sinned. And Lord, you know that I've slapped Josiah in the face. Lord, I am so sorry for slapping Josiah. And I confess that sin. Now, you may be wondering, how specific was the confession? Let's look at Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 5. It shall be, when he is guilty in any of these matters, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. Did you get it? Confession was very, very specific. He would confess in the very thing that he had sinned. When we kneel before God and confess, we confess very specifically. Dear Lord, I'm sorry I've sinned. Dear Lord, I was unkind to my wife. Dear Lord, I yelled at my children. Dear Lord, I was dishonest at work. It is this specific confession, this confession of very definite sins, that opens our heart for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that we are cleansed within. Notice Steps to Christ, page 38, and the way Ellen White puts it. True confession is always of a specific character and acknowledges particular sins. They may be of such a nature as to be brought before God only. They may be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals who've suffered injury through them, or they may be of a public character and should be as publicly confessed. Notice there are three things here that are mentioned. Number one, there are times that we confess our sins to God and to God alone. Number two, there are times we confess our sins to another that we've wronged. And number three, there are times that we make public confession. But there is a central truth, whatever the nature of confession is. And here it is. But all confession should be definite to the point acknowledging the very sins of which you are guilty. Steps to Christ, page 38. See, there's, there's no real value in this vague kind of nebulous confession in which we get down on our knees and say, Oh Lord, if I've sinned today, if I've wounded somebody today, if I've been dishonest, none of that business at all. None of if I've done this and none so general confession, but down on our knees saying, God, I'm guilty. Today I lost my temper with my wife. Lord, today I'm guilty. Today, Lord, I was dishonest. Or today I got angry and yelled at a, at a, at a subordinate, a working colleague. You see, unless our confession of sin is definite, there is little cleansing that really occurs inside. What does sin do? Sin clogs the arteries of our spiritual hearts. It corrodes the channels of the soul. It blocks the blessing God longs to pour out through us. Now, you may be wondering about some basic questions. And here are some questions that you might be wondering about. Question number one. When should we confess our sins to God alone? Two, when should we ask forgiveness from somebody that we've wronged? Three, when is it appropriate to publicly confess our sins? You may wonder about these questions, and I want to probe them with you, because very often Christians confess their sins to God, but they still feel some guilt. And I've had a lot of people come to me through the years in my meetings, and they say, Pastor, I've confessed my sin to God, but I still feel guilty. Why? The Apostle Paul gives us some help in understanding that. The Apostle Paul writes that he longed to have a conscience without offense toward God and men, Acts 24, verse 16. 
what does it mean to have a conscience void of offense toward God? And what does it mean to have a conscience void of offense toward men? Here's what it means. A conscience void of offense toward God means that the moral guilt between me and God is removed as I've confessed my sin. What does it mean to have a conscience void of offense toward man? It means that the psychological guilt that I've had in my mind because I've hurt another is gone. When we confess our sins to God, we're forgiven. The Bible says in Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, it says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So when we come to Jesus and confess, He does the forgiving. But there are times that a sense of guilt persists. So if our sense of guilt persists, we ask ourselves some questions. And here's what we ask. If you've confessed your sin to God and the, and the guilt's persisting, you ask these questions. Have I wronged, have we wronged others or hurt them in, in any way that the Holy Spirit is leading us to ask for their forgiveness? So if I've confessed my sin to God, but I'm still feeling this sense of guilt, then I'm saying, have I hurt somebody else that the Holy Spirit is leading me to go to that person and ask for their forgiveness? When do I make a public confession? Let's suppose I've hurt somebody else, and let's suppose that I've really wounded them. When is public confession appropriate? Let me tell you when public confession is not appropriate. If you have said something about somebody else and you've damaged their reputation, you go and repair the fence where it's broken. You don't have to get up in church and say, oh, I said such and such to three people about Joe's reputation, about John's reputation. No, you go to the three people that you've spoken to about his reputation and you clear it up. If you have hurt Joe in any way, you want that barrier between you and Joe to be broken down so it's not necessary to make a public confession. You go to Joe and ask him to forgive you. On your knees as you pray before God and as you confess your sin before God, Know that God forgives you. Your moral guilt is gone. If you've wounded another, you do what you can to correct the wounds on another. If you've cheated from uh, another person out of money, on your knees, you, you tell God you're sorry, you confess that sin to them, and you repay them. In other words, Christianity is very, very practical. When do you go to another? When you've hurt them, when you've wounded them, when you've defrauded them, when you've been dishonest with them. Why do you go to another? First, so that you'll have a clear conscience before God. Second, that person may very well know what you've done anyway, and you want your Christian witness to be positive to them. And thirdly, you don't want any barrier between you and them. You want positive relationships if the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out powerfully in latter-day power, it's going to mean some confession takes place where we get our arms around one another. We tell one another we're sorry for hurting one another. We ask God to deeply cleanse our hearts. That was taking place in the upper room. This Christ that reaches out to us with such open arms invites us into one another's arms. This Christ that reaches out to us with open arms invites us to confess our sins to Him and our faults, our mistakes, the way we've wounded another to one another. You know, here are some principles that I think are really important to follow. Is there anything that that I can ask myself? Is there anything in my life that hinders me from receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Is there some sin lurking deep within that I've not confessed and forsaken? Is there someone I've hurt or offended whose forgiveness I should ask? Have I fully accepted God's forgiveness or do I still unnecessarily harbor feelings of guilt? Do I fully trust Jesus? 
to forgive my sins? These are thought-provoking questions. Questions that lead us to our knees. Questions that lead us to open our heart to receive the joy of forgiveness. You know, I love the way David puts it. One of the great joys that I have found in my life is to read the book of Psalms. And David puts it this way in Psalm 32. And he uses a very powerful word in the original Hebrew language. He says, blessed is he, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, this is an amazing passage, blessed. It's the Hebrew word asher, A-S-H-E-R, would spell it in English. And it means fully at peace, totally content, one who has an inner harmony. Would you like to have this inner harmony of the soul? Would you like to be at peace with God? Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven. Now, notice as David goes on in the passage, it says, When I kept silent, verse 3 of Psalm 32, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand, God, was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. But then I acknowledged my sin. Look, what's David talking about? He's saying, when I sinned and I kept that sin inside, it zapped my energy. I lost energy. When I sinned, I felt pain in my bones. In other words, guilt has a residual effect in your physical health and your body. Guilt clogs the arteries of the soul. So guilt has this dual or this triple effect. First, it affects me spiritually. There's a barrier between me and God. Second, it affects me physically. There is unusual pain that comes at times when I'm so guilty. And third, it affects me psychologically. It takes away the joy of my life. But here's the tremendous joy of confession. When we confess our sins to God, when we kneel before God and confess our sins, there is this sense, as David said, create in me a clean heart of God. When our hearts are clean because we've confessed our sins, there's a new joy that flows through our life. There's a new happiness that radiates in our being. There's this new relationship with somebody else. I remember it was a Friday night, the sun was setting, and the doorbell rang in my house. I got up and went to the door, and one of my students was there. I, have to be te- I happened to be teaching at a Bible institute, college-level students. And the student said to me, Pastor, can I talk to you? I said, sure, come on in. And he said, I'd like to talk to you away from your family. I'd like to talk to you privately. So we entered in my study, and the memory is vivid in my mind as if it were yesterday. And the student said to me, Pastor, I have to confess something to you. And before night came tonight, I wanted to confess it. He said, Pastor, I just wanted to tell you that I have been spreading rumors about you on this campus, saying some things that were totally untrue. And as I was praying about it, the Holy Spirit convicted me, and I confessed it to God, but I haven't confessed it to you. And I want to confess it to you in case you hear what I have said about you. I want you to know I'm deeply sorry. I want you to know as well that I have gone to everybody that I can remember that I spoke to, and I've asked them to forgive me. And I've told them that the things I've said were merely rumors. You know, I reached out and embraced that student. He wept together with me in my arms. We knelt and prayed in my study. And for the last three or four decades, we have been good friends. You know, there are times in your life that all you need to do is confess before God. You're cleansed. Your sin is gone. There are other times in your life that the Holy Spirit impresses you to go to somebody. You've broken a fence. You've built a wall. Tear down that wall, my friend. Tear down that wall. When should you publicly confess? Only when the sins are publicly known and they're blatant before the whole church. Remember this. Confession is cleansing. It brings health and joy to the whole being. We're always challenged when we think about honest confession. And what does that look like in real life? 
I'm happy that we have with us today Janet Page, Associate Secretary of the General Conference Ministerial Association. But more than that, a woman of God who's experienced the power of God, Janet, in your life. What, what does honest confession look like and what does it feel like? <laughs> I'm not sure I know. <laughs> but um, all I can share is what's happened in my life. And as I was asked to do this, I've been praying and praying about what to do. And just nothing was coming to mind. And then um, this last week, the person that was scheduling me to, to do this, um, the, I, there was kind of a misunderstanding as far as time. And, and I went into panic when I got the email and emailed back that, you know, the time's just not going to work for me. And they emailed something back and I emailed back. And you were copied on all this. Now, you didn't know I was going to talk about this, I know, but you were copied on all this, and you emailed me, and you said, Janet, I think your email is, is harsh sounding. Uh, you said you may not have meant it that way, but it sounded harsh, and, and I thought, you know, I read the email. I was so busy, so rushed, had deadlines, and I'm going, ah, oh, that Derek again, <laughs> you know, always teaching me. Oh, and This is and, very real life. Well, immediately, as I thought that came into my mind, and was Proverbs. I can't tell you where in Proverbs, but I read Proverbs a lot because I was told I'd be a wise woman if I read it, read it every day, which I haven't succeeded at, but I try. And was uh, that the rebuke of the righteous, you know, is good <laughs> and that I need to listen. So I thought, you know, he's, he's probably right. And so I shot back an email at, at this lady here with Hope Channel uh, apologizing, telling her, you know, Derek says my email sounds harsh. I, I, I want to apologize for that. And so that was, I thought, kind of the end of it. But of course, you know, I still wasn't feeling good about it. But I didn't have time to deal with it. I don't know how it is for you, but uh, it just, at times, I, I do things that I know I don't feel right about. But yet I am too busy to deal with it. You know, I don't even want to talk to God about it because I'm not sure what he's going to say and I'm afraid of what he might say. And, but one of the things I've found about spending time with God is he will speak to me. And a lot of times I'm not sure I want to hear it. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done that. You're so perfect. You probably haven't, but I'll be reading God's word. And it's like, I can tell he's starting to say something to me. Not that I hear voices, but just that impression. And it's so faint. And it's like, I don't think I want to hear this. And so I'll start reading God's word all the faster to avoid it. But I'm learning through the years here to stop that and start saying, because if I don't, it separates me from God. And to stop and say, okay, God, what are you, what are you trying to say? I don't think I want to hear this right now, but what do you want to say? And I just really felt like, you know, God was telling me, uh, you need to not just apologize to this lady at Hope Channel. You need to ask her forgiveness. And I said, well, what was I doing that's so wrong? And God started showing me my heart, that my heart wasn't right about how I wrote the email and how I was demanding what I thought I should have or whatever. And, you know, I'm just so thankful that God forgives us. He loves us so much and, and he will come in and rebuke me, but he comes in and loves me through his word. You know, he'll, he'll just start showing me things of how much he loves me. And so um, later that day, I think it was, I, found, I got up the courage and I, I emailed the lady back again and told her, I said, you know, I really feel like, you know, God's telling me, I can't just ask your apology. I need to ask your forgiveness because it was so wrong what I did. And to me, that's what forgiveness is about. Fortunately, she forgave me full heartedly. She's a sweet lady. But it's, it's, it's too easy to confess but always have excuses. Well, I did it because I was so busy. Uh, I, you know, it, I was irritable or whatever because, because, you know, it's been a bad day, what all. And what I found is God saying, no, it's because you're sinful. It's because you're selfish. You're sinful. You're wretched. And you need to just confess it. And there's such healing in that. You know, it's incredibly practical. Uh, not a large event, but a real opportunity to say, I need to honestly confess and, and ask for forgiveness. And I pray that that testimony will bless your life as you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, that you can follow his amazing plan for your life. Thank you, Elder Morris and Mrs. Page, for sharing that testimony. You know, honest confession isn't always very easy. 
but it was an essential part of the disciples' experience before Pentecost, and we need to experience it still today. It's the only way to experience the sweet assurance, the blessed peace, the joyful rest of sins forgiven. Pastor Finley shared with us the three kinds of confession, to God alone, to others we've wronged, and publicly making right public wrongs. I don't know about you, but I've always found confessing privately to God much easier than apologizing to others. There's something about it that is just difficult for the proud heart. It's very humbling to admit when we've made a mistake. And I think that the devil knows just how powerful honest confession is in the life of the Christian. He knows that sins confessed brings a sense of peace to the soul. He knows that making wrongs right brings a confidence that Jesus has forgiven our sins and that the promises of God are for us. And so I think that the devil often tempts us to put off making things right with others. One of the ways he discourages honest repentance, honest confession, is with a lie. That shouldn't surprise us because he is the father of lies. The lie the devil tells us is that if we were to confess our fault to a person we've wronged, that person would think less of us. We would be humiliated and seen perhaps as an awful person. Yet the opposite is usually the case. I found that when I've followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit and made honest confession, it has been met with respect and admiration and appreciation from those I've apologized to. I rather think we all know how difficult honest confession can be, and we respect the integrity and courage that it takes. Friend, if the Holy Spirit is bringing something to your memory, even some little thing that you need to make right, don't hesitate and don't delay. Pray about it, yes. But if after praying about it, you still have the conviction, you still can't get it off your mind, just go and make it right. It may be a small thing, but that's all the more reason not to let it trouble your conscience when you can easily, through honest confession, put it away forever. It's the experience the disciples had in preparation for Pentecost, and it's the experience we still need today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the example of the disciples, the example of honest confession. And Lord, we want to have this experience that you might be able to pour out your spirit upon your church today. I pray for each one of us as we consider your voice speaking to our hearts, that if there is something that needs to be made right, that we'll confess it and find the peace that can only come through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.